Welcome to the Renaissance Church Podcast. We want to help you walk with God, grow in community, and live on mission. We exist to bring the good news of Jesus into all of life and all the earth. My name is Chris Kipp, and I serve as the lead pastor of Renaissance Church here in Richmond, Texas. And I hope this resource encourages you and helps you grow in a relationship with Christ. Here is this week's teaching. Again, welcome today. So glad that you're here. Uh, I really loved uh, how Havana led us in worship. Can we thank her one more time just for what she what she put into that? Um, it's beautiful to see, you know, she kind of led us through songs that, that were like story, like gospel story songs. And I, I don't know what your story is, but I was a young man who was just on the, the wrong path. Um, I, I went to private school, so I was in chapel all the time. I was in a home that, uh, you know, we, we believed in God. We went to church sometimes, most of the time, I guess. Um, and yet I just found myself walking down this path. And it was almost like I felt powerless to stop myself from the next bad decision. I don't know if you've ever felt that way before. It's like you just see this trail and you kind of know, I probably shouldn't be doing this, but it's like you just can't stop yourself. And the world was telling me, this is it. Like, this is the lifestyle. This is, you're ma- like, you're, you're, you've made it. And, uh, and I just had this overwhelming sense that this was going to end badly. <laughs> This was going to crash and burn. And I got invited to a youth camp in Colorado. And I went there because, A, when you're young, you might meet a girl at camp. That's always fun. B, there's going to be rock climbing in Colorado. Like, why pass it up? So I went to Colorado to, to go to youth camp. And uh, I heard a man share the good news of Jesus. And he did it... Um, with a, a warmth of heart, a sincerity, like tears in his eyes talking about the sacrifice that Jesus paid because of my sins. And it's like I was hearing it for the very first time. And I will never forget that moment. And, and the way I describe it is if you've ever had an x-ray before and they put that lead blanket on you, have y'all felt that before? Yeah, you know, it's like that, that weight is almost like I experienced for the very first time the presence of the Lord. And it felt like that. It was almost just like, whoa. Like, I just wanted to go lower in the room, if that makes sense. And by God's grace, my heart was opened and I responded to the good news of Jesus. And my whole life has just been sort of this clumsy, uh, just little by little growing more and more into the image of my Savior, Jesus. Uh, What never, ever crossed my mind at that point in my life was how would Jesus changing my heart as a teenage young man have anything to do with government and politics, right? Like, you just, that just did not cross my mind. I, uh, Saint Bernard of Clairvaux, he, he, he describes the progression of, of loves, and he, he said, we, we all kind of begin this uh, spiritual awakening with a love of God for self's sake. Like, I need Jesus, right? I, I need him, like, for my own benefit. And, and I kind of thought, you know, that will probably benefit my friends and my family and, you know, my, my future wife and children and all that kind of stuff. But I never, ever thought, how would that actually change or benefit an entire nation. And that, that's what I want to talk about today. Have you ever considered how your personal faith, how what Jesus is doing inside of you might actually benefit an entire nation? Um, if you're here today and you are new to faith or you're returning to faith or you've been walking with Jesus for, for many years, I just want to say I'm so glad that you're here and we are, we're doing a series on politics called Fount of Freedom because what could go wrong, right? <laughs> what could go wrong? Um, it, it is slightly polarizing these days. It is very heated many times. It's something that we kind of say, hey, please don't talk about religion or politics at the dinner table, right? So we're, we're kind of breaking all the rules and we're gonna talk about both religion and politics today. And what I wanna do, here's my goal, okay? The, here's the goal of today's message is I wanna get you to think. 
I want to get you to think about how your faith actually can benefit our nation. I, I want to show you a particular way that you are, as Jesus said, the salt of the earth and you are the light of the world. If you're a follower of Jesus, that's who you are. Like it or not, you are it, okay? You're the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And um, I want to call us to become thoughtful, reasonable, convictional Christians. And I want you to know that contrary to maybe what you feel, you are not a nemesis to society. You are its beneficent, okay? So that's my goal today. We're going to look at John chapter 6. If you want to go with me to John chapter 6, um, I heard someone say this past week, uh, Halloween used to be the scariest night of the year. It's now election night. Um, and that's a bipartisan joke because everyone's going to feel that way in some way probably. Oh my gosh, what's going to happen tonight? Uh, it, it's a little bit scary for, I think, a lot of Americans who maybe feel torn in this time period. And I think what Jesus tells us here in John chapter 6 is so important for us as we look at the fount of freedom. Where, where does the idea of freedom actually come from? Before we read that, I just want to start with a contrast. And I just want to look at two current rising ideologies that you're very familiar with, that you see that, you know, because you probably are seeing news stories and all that kind of stuff, none of this is going to be new information for you. I'm just going to point them out. And the, the first one is what I'm just going to call uncivil civil rights. I think I have an image that goes with this, and it just shows uh, a scene that happened after the George uh, Floyd riots or during that time period in Minneapolis. And uh, of course, this is not new, but these are becoming increasingly more publicly expressed, okay? And this is like individual rights taken almost to the extreme, right? It's, it's, uh, it's the protests that are for the victim. And what happens a lot of times, especially in a society that loses uh, its moral center, is that something else fills the void where that morality used to, to live. And the new morality is, who's the victim? And we're going to go protest for them, right? It, it's, it's a protest mentality. And uh, it's pushing individual rights to the extreme of the literal destruction of society. It's very extreme. Uh, it goes by many different names and labels. Some, some might call it woke or wokeism. And as I saw that picture, it reminded me of, of course, there were no cameras back then, but the paintings that we have of the French Revolution, where the mob became the judge and the jury and the executioner. And that was a very tumultuous and scary time in France. This movement, it critiques injustice, which there are injustices, hello? So it's not wrong. And yet, it, it's also, um, it, it's a critique of power, but it, it relies on power as the solution to the problem of power. Does that make sense? It's power for power. Allegiance is coerced via social pressure and through the court system. It has a redefined morality, but it holds that morality very stringently, very stringently. And it's a power for power dynamic. Um, this uh, news story, I found it this past week. This is very recent in England. There is a British veteran by the name of Adam Smith Connor. He served in Afghanistan, and he was recently found guilty for praying silently outside of an abortion clinic. His story is that many years ago, uh, his son was aborted. And so he uh, has a very uh, tender spot in his heart for the unborn. And so he went there and he was praying outside. He wasn't you know, preaching. He wasn't saying anything to anybody walking in or out. He was praying silently to himself. He was approached by two police officers. And apparently there is an act there, a public spaces act that created a buffer zone. 
And inside that buffer zone, you, you could not do anything uh, that would disapprove of abortion. And so the police officers asked him, what is the nature of your prayer? They asked him, what are you praying about? Then he was uh, charged, he went to a court, and he was actually found guilty for praying silently because it was a sign of disapproval of abortion. That's a thought crime. So it says, today, the court has decided that certain thoughts, silent thoughts, can be illegal in the United Kingdom. Smith Connor said after the ruling, that cannot be right. All I did was pray to God in the privacy of my own, my own mind, and yet I stand convicted as a criminal. Sir Edward Lee, the father of the House of Commons, he would be the, the, the most prominent member of their uh, parliament or the most senior member. He expressed outrage at the outcome. It is disgraceful that in Britain in 2024, someone can be put on trial for praying silently in his head. Unfortunately, we have seen repeated cases of free speech under threat in the UK when it comes to the expression of Christian beliefs. To offer a prayer silently in the depth of your heart cannot be an offense. The government must clarify urgently that freedom of thought is protected as a basic human right. So that's what's happening in Western nations across the world. Okay, here's the second rising ideology, and it's the next picture if you go to that. It's Islamic extremism. It's kind of the opposite of what we just saw, right? If one is like the extremes of individual rights, this would be the extreme of like moral conformity of, 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 of a community. They must conform. And what's so crazy is it's growing in Western nations where we're seeing the extremes of the individual rights thing. We also see the other counter movement growing at the same exact time. For example, in, in Britain right now, thousands of mosques are slated to be built there because it's rising. However, in Iran, 50,000 of the 75,000 mosques are actually slated to be closed. You know why? Because in Iran, the people are saying, Islam is not working for us. And they're turning to Jesus in great numbers, in great numbers. This movement, uh, it's allegiance through coerced violence. It seeks power and uses power to, uh, to uh, impose very stringent moral standards. For example, um, in Afghanistan, after the U.S. withdrawal three years ago, the, the Taliban has taken over that area, and they recently released their um, morality laws. They were approved, it was approved by the top Taliban leader, and uh, here's what that law contains. It bans women from speaking publicly, traveling without a male guardian, making eye contact with any male who is not within their immediate family, and it requires full face and body cover. Punishments range from a verbal warning to imprisonment. And those two ideologies are rising in our world. And here's what I just want to say, is that when they get to the extremes, they actually start to look identical. They look identical. I'm not saying that every social justice warrior is burning down cities, okay? And I'm not saying that every Muslim person is an extremist who wants world domination. I'm not saying that. I know that that's not true. However, we cannot be blind to the, to the reality that these are rising uh, ideologies that are absolutely being expressed in our culture right now. And they are both power for power. Allegiance is coerced. And both show differently that freedom is oftentimes freedom's worst enemy. Neither have sufficient 
ideological guardrails to curb extremism. And both are totalitarian ideas. Both of them violate what I want to talk about today, which is Christ and the conscience, the freedom of your conscience. Where does that freedom come from? Where does it originate? And how do we make sure that we don't lose it? You guys up for talking about that today? We're going to talk about Jesus and all of the things he said. And you might be thinking, what in the world is a preacher doing talking about this kind of thing on a Sunday morning? And what does this have to do with the Bible and Jesus and Christianity? And here's what I would say. It has everything to do with Jesus and Christianity, in my humble opinion, okay? I want to show you that. In John chapter 6, why don't you go there with me? We're going to look at verse 41 through 51. These are red letters, so this is a teaching of Jesus. Just so you know, John's gospel is different from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It is not a synoptic. John is really, really uh, concerned with you and I understanding the identity of Jesus. So he records seven I am statements. We're going to look at one of those today, and I'm just going to pick it up kind of in the middle in verse 41. Here's what it says. Therefore, the Jews started complaining about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They were saying, isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I have come down from heaven? Je Jesus answered them, stop complaining among yourselves. I love Jesus. He's like, stop complaining. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has listened to and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, I tell you, anyone who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that anyone may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. The bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. This is the word of the Lord. So Jesus has this encounter with the Jewish people. He's doing something very, very important. He's connecting the dots of their history, right? The exodus from Egypt, all the things that they rehearse every year. They remind themselves of how God delivered them from Egypt, how they went into the wilderness, right? And they were going to die of starvation. They cry out to God and he sends this stuff called manna to come and form on the ground. And the word manna literally translates this to this. What is it? Have you ever had a meal before? Someone puts it before you, you're like, what is it? That's manna, okay? It's, it's like, I don't know what this stuff is, but it'll work, you know? Um, and the Lord fed them in the desert. And all of that, this is the beauty of God. This is the, God, he, he thinks in centuries and millennia. Is all of this was going to point ultimately to Jesus as the bread of life, the one who came down from heaven. And just as they were starving in the desert and about to die, Jesus says, look, you, without taking me, the bread of life, you're going to die. But I've come to give you life. And it's life eternal. It's life forever. If you, if you come to me, you will live forever. It's amazing. It's amazing. He's connecting the dots. And so Jesus, he, he makes this incredible statement. And I just want you to think about what it means. It absolutely means that he's the Messiah and Lord. When Moses has that little burning bush encounter and the voice says, you know, I am that I am, Jesus is connecting the dots to say, no, and I am. He's claiming his Messiahship. And I just want you to think about what this means for us because what he does is he gives them a little lesson on how salvation actually works. And here's the crazy thing is this actually connects to how nations work or how they work best. So here's what it means. God 
acts directly upon the individual conscience. Did you see that in what Jesus said? No one comes to the Father, or or no one comes to me unless he's drawn by the Father. That's what he said. Unless the Father draws him. No one can come to me. No one can believe in me unless the Father draws him. Now, I know that whole idea creates fistfights in parking lots at churches and and, and colleges because they're like, no, it's free will. No, God's sovereign. No, it's free will. Just forget all that, okay? You have a free will and God is sovereign at the same time, okay? And how that works, good luck figuring that out on on this side of heaven. Someday we'll all understand how that works, okay? But what that means is that when I was a young man in high school and I'm hearing this and it feels like I'm hearing it for the very first time, something was happening inside of me that was beyond me. God was doing something in my heart. I was being drawn. He was acting upon my individual conscience, which means this, that we have to respect the conscience of a person because that's where God acts. Does that make sense? God acts upon it directly. It also means that saving faith is never externally coerced, but it is inwardly convictional. Nobody can force you. Parents, you don't have to force your children to believe. You don't. You've you've stepped out of being a parent. You've put on the, the role of Holy Spirit or God or Jesus, right? And you're trying to be him. You're not him, right? You're just a parent. And we cannot coerce anyone into faith, which is really good if you're not a Christian, right? We're not here to force people into anything. The third thing is Jesus presents his life, his message, and his miracles to everyone. Yet, get this, in his earthly ministry, Jesus himself could not convert anyone that the father wasn't drawing what even jesus who's preaching to the crowds who's doing the miracles and blind people see and deaf people hear and dead children get raised and people that have evil spirits get set free and he does all that that awesome stuff that he's still doing by the way He does all that stuff, and even that could not actually convert somebody without the Father working directly upon that individual conscience. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? Do you you see that in the verse? This is the genius of Jesus, and and I'll explain what, what this means. If you just grab hold of this thread and follow it with me. So how does my faith, what Jesus is doing in me, fractal out from being just not just good for me and then good for my family, my friends, and, and I guess my church and my community, but then actually being to the benefit of nations? Well, let's just start at the very personal level. I can't take credit for my own ability to respond positively to the message of Jesus. Why is that good news? Because there's no self-righteousness in the gospel of Jesus. No self-righteousness, which is the secret fuel of extremism, ideological tyranny, totalitarianism, and a whole host of evil things. Self-righteousness is ugly stuff, and there's no room for it in the teachings of Jesus. I can take no credit. Why am I saved? I I said yes to Jesus. How did that happen? I don't know. I just knew I needed him. God was working directly upon me. And I can't even take credit for that. Thank you, Jesus. It's all grace. All grace. No self-righteousness. Okay, so that's personal. Now, think about just a little bit wider. We just talked about this. A Christian does not coerce. They witness. We, we never coerce, we're never forcing it on anyone, we're just witnessing to the life and the message and the miracles of Jesus. I think about um, 
Jesus, he's in Luke chapter nine, he's on his way back to Jerusalem. He's going through this Samaritan village. And in this village, he wants to kind of stop in and kind of, you know, refresh, maybe spend the night before he gets on down the road. And it says that they, they do not allow him into the village. They, they don't welcome him in. And James and John, the sons of thunder, right? I, I love the nicknames that Jesus gives his disciples. The sons of thunder is like, Lord, do you want us to call lightning down on these fools? We'll show them. You're God. And he rebukes them harshly. Like, you do not understand how this works. We do not coerce people into anything. We only witness to the life and the message and the miracles of Jesus. So no self-righteousness, no coercion. Here's the third thing. How does that go beyond even like touching nations and politics? Here it is. Christianity is not to be directly imposed upon a people. Rather, it operates indirectly through values and principles. Think about that. The genius of Jesus is this. Every ideology that wants to just kind of rip the world apart is, is um, it lacks the sufficient guardrails within it to keep it from extremism. And Jesus builds into this whole thing. So the understanding of God's sovereignty in my own salvation actually is a guardrail that keeps me from becoming a coercive jerk that wants to make everybody do what I do and believe what I believe and worship the way that I worship and, and go to church where I go to church and all the things that could happen to Christians if we get this wrong. Does that make sense what I'm saying? It's indirect through values and principles. The frustration of Jesus' first followers were, were this. Why don't we just take over this thing, Jesus? Let's throw Rome off of our backs. If, you know, these guys have been persecuting us for so long, and now you're here, like, come on, let's go. Let's throw them off. And he's like, no, 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 no. If Jesus had done that, he may have successfully thrown off Rome, but what Jesus did is so much better because what Jesus teaches us actually throws off tyranny everywhere, not just in first century Jerusalem. Hello? It's, it's amazing. And so any attempt to directly impose Christian, Christianity upon someone else is a failure not to take our faith uh, seriously, but it's actually a failure to not take it seriously enough. Okay, so to actually be formed into like a thoughtful, reasonable, convictional Christian is to take these words and to actually think about what does that mean for like the whole of society and to take it that seriously that if, if this is not how it works, if it's not through power, if it's not through coercion, if it's not through forcing anyone into my ideology, then how must I create a, a society? How should I advocate for the welfare of all people? We respect individual conscience and rights while appealing to God's moral law that reflects his ultimate design for human flourishing. So here's the big idea. Only nations that are steeped in Christian thought have been able to successfully create the freedom of conscience, the freedom of speech, and the free exercise of religion. That's it. No one else has been able to do it, ever. And it is exactly what is at stake right now in our nation. I just want to give you some up-to-date examples of things that are happening. Um, have you all ever heard of Richard Dawkins, a famous atheist? Yeah? He, uh, he wrote a book called The God Delusion, and um, he is outspokenly not a Christian. He does not believe in Christ. He does not believe a word of Christianity. He is, he is a staunch atheist and has done a lot to advance the cause of atheism in the world. But in an interview recently, he said he considers himself a cultural Christian. That's weird. 
he, he says this, um, he was slightly horrified to learn that Oxford Street in London was promoting Ramadan, the Muslim month, for fasting instead of Easter. Dawkins went on to explain, I do think we are a culturally Christian country. I call myself a, cu a cultural Christian. I'm not a believer, but there is a distinction between be being a believing Christian and a cultural Christian, Dawkins noted. He said, I love hymns and Christmas carols. And I sort of feel at home in the Christian ethos. And I feel that we are a Christian country in that sense. And I would not be happy if, for example, we lost all of our cathedrals and our beautiful parish churches. Now, this is so ironic to me because this man writes books that talks people out of Christianity. And yet when the churches can't afford to keep the lights on, he's like, oh, man, this is so sad. It's like insane to me. He said, I call myself a cultural Christian, and I think it would be truly dreadful, get this, if we substituted any alternative religion. He's an atheist who's reasonable enough to say no one else has been able to create the kind of freedoms that we have right now in our, in our nations. He said, I have to choose my words carefully. It seems to be a fundamentally decent religion in a way that I think Islam is not, he commented. So interesting. Another one. This is a young lady. She was an outspoken atheist, Ayn Hersey Ali. She now says that she is a Christian. She has a kind of a crazy story. Uh, as, a, as a young woman in Somalia, she was a part of the Muslim Brotherhood, and she was radicalized by the Muslim Brotherhood, along with a whole bunch of other young people at that time period. Um, however, during that time, she suffered female genital mutilation at the hands of uh, Muslim Brotherhood members. And because of that, she declared herself an atheist. So she went from radicalized Islam to none of that. Okay? Other extreme. She said, she has turned to Christianity because I ultimately found life without any spiritual solace unendurable. Indeed, very nearly self-destructive. Atheism failed to answer a simple question. What is the meaning and purpose of life? She said, arguing that the void left, get this, by the retreat of the church in the modern world has merely been filled by a jumble of irrational quasi-religious dogma. She says, there's no need to look for some new age concoction of medication and mindfulness. Christianity has it all. Another reason she made the switch, she said, is global. The writer said in the essay that Western civilization is under threat from multiple fronts, including Russia and China, global Islamism, and woke ideology, the very things that we're talking about this morning. With, we endeavor to fend off these threats with modern secular tools of military, economic, diplomatic, technological efforts to defeat, bribe, persuade, appease, or surveil. And yet with every round of conflict, we find ourselves losing ground. The only way to successfully fight off these threats is to answer the question, what is it that truly unites us? The only credible answer, she says, I believe, lies in our desire to uphold the legacy of the Judeo-Christian tradition. It includes an elaborate set of ideas and institutions designed to safeguard human life, freedom, and dignity. Wow. She's literally been on both extremes and says, you know what? Jesus is the answer. Christianity has it all. Fascinating to hear these stories. People who recognize the gift of what our faith has to offer the world. And yet they also recognize that this faith and the gift of our faith is being threatened right now. Now, and here's what I just want to ask. What's better? I mean, what's better? Is burning down cities better? 
Is, is you know, a Islamic takeover better? And what I would just say is what's better is what Paul said so beautifully and succinctly in Philippians 4, 5. I think I have a slide for this, James. Here's the way he says it. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. He's giving a, a list of things to the church at Philippi to say, okay, here's final instructions. Here's, here's what you do, guys. Here, here's here's what, what I want you to focus on. And in that list, he gets to this statement, and it's so beautiful. Let your reasonableness be evident or be known to everyone. And the, the uh, original Greek word denotes seemly, fitting, equitable, fair, moderate, forbearing, not insisting on the letter of the law. It expresses that considerateness that looks humanely and reasonably at the facts of a case. It's reasonable. It's rendered as gentle in 1 Timothy 3, in contrast to contentiousness. In Titus 3, that word is rendered uh, as gentle and associated with meekness. It's the quality of wisdom that's from above in association with the good, it's reasonableness. And I think what the world needs is thoughtful, thoughtful, reasonable, convictional Christians. These are in short supply. They need people like you and me who are just absolutely dependent on God's grace, who are clumsily taking the next step with Jesus being transformed by his life and his message and his miracles. People who are seeing in greater and greater ways that our God is the fount of freedom and that his ways, they're not just good for me and they're not just good for my family, but they're actually good for the world around me. I wanna uh, close with a couple things. The first is a story of a young man growing up in Virginia in the 60s. Do we have anybody that grew up in the 60s? A few of you? Yeah, mm-hmm. Could tell by your psychedelic tie-dye t-shirts that y'all had on back there. <laughs> Just kidding. This man actually grew up in the 1760s, so I don't think there's anybody who grew up in the 1760s uh, in the room. <laughs> he grew up Anglican, which is like the American version of the Church of England, at that time period, it was the state-sponsored religion, meaning the tax dollars of that state were funding the church. And he grew up in a family that was there every Sunday at the Anglican church. And what he saw was a, a Baptist pastors and Baptist adherents being persecuted by Anglicans, jailed because they were preaching without permits from the Anglican church. And that bothered him as a young man. He, uh, he broke from the family tradition and the, like all the local Virginia boys would go to, uh, you know, to UT, but he decided to go to A&M, right? Uh, and it just created this whole uproar. I know we have some Aggies in the room that were rejoicing over UT's loss yesterday. Shame on you. Shame on you. And so he goes to this college at New Jersey at Princeton that is now what we call Princeton University, and he starts to study under a Scottish Presbyterian minister by the name of John Witherspoon. And he begins to understand the, this, this concept of actual conscience, that God acts upon a conscience, and that there should be a freedom for a person to have their own conscience and to respect that, and that no law should be, should be created, and that there should not you know, be the state Sponsored church is going to enforce itself on other you know, churches and all this stuff. It just be becomes solidified in his mind. And this man's name was James Madison. And if you know anything about him, he's the father or the architect of the American Constitution. And before he was working on the American Constitution, he was working on the Virginia Constitution. Here's what he wrote. Because we hold it a fundamental and undeniable truth that religion or the duty which we owe to our creator 
and the manner of discharging it can be directly, directed only by, get this, reason and conviction, not by force or violence. Wow. The, the re religion then of every man must be left to the conviction and conscience of every man, and it is the right of every man to exercise it as they may dictate. This right is in its nature an inalienable right. It is the duty of every man to render to the creator such homage and such as only as he believes to be acceptable to him. This duty is precedent both in order of time and in degree of obligation to the claims of civil society. Here's what that means in our common English today is that we should have a freedom of conscience and that that should, become, that should come first before any government interference. That's what, that's, that's what he said. It's amazing. And what he did in that moment is he defined for us what the freedom of conscience is. And what I would just want you to see is this. He was a thoughtful, reasonable, convictional Christian. He wrote a letter to Thomas Jefferson after the, um, I guess, this statute for religious freedom in Virginia. And he said this, I flatter myself that we have in this country extinguished forever the ambitious hope of making laws for the human mind. And I guess the question of our day is, have we extinguished forever the ambitious hope of making laws for the human mind? And what do we do about that as followers of Jesus? What I wanna encourage you to do is to pray. And to begin to consider how you might respond in this season as a citizen of our nation who is a thoughtful and reasonable and convictional Christian. Because the things that were given to us by those kinds of Christians are under threat and it will be maintained and kept today by the kinds of people that are characterized by those very words, thoughtful, reasonable, and convictional. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Well, thank you again for listening today. And if this was helpful to you, you can like, share, subscribe, or leave a kind review. And you can learn more about Renaissance Church at ren-church.org.